What a great day. The sun's out and the waves are rolling in out there. I'm going to take my first risk of the day and say that I'm the only Australian in the room. I think I can safely bet on that uh, today. The, the other thing I want to sort of bring out to you today is that I am an introvert who was formerly a CPA, a financial advisor, a lifeguard, and now today I'm talking to you all about human behaviour at the beach site. I think that's pretty special. You might ask, why am I living in Atlanta, Georgia, and not in Sydney, Australia, where I could be having the experience of what you've got outside? And there was a transformation in my life where I went from the numbers to the people. My passion in life is really about helping people understand others and unlock their human potential. That's what I'm all about. So today I'm going to build on what Matt's been talking about around the power of engagement and take that model a couple of steps further so that you can see how to engage your clients at a deeper level and customise the service experience. Before I get started, I just want to share a story with you because I'm sure all of us in the room have had a difficult client before and that we've all lost a client before. I don't think there'd be anyone in here who hasn't because you're all successful, you've been through the hoops in business and as advisors and wealth managers. And I had a client in Australia who was referred to me through a family connection or a, and a friend connection. And they were a reasonably elderly husband and wife. And I want to be a little bit careful how, what, what we define elderly as, but they were in their early 60s. The wife had 10 million or so dollars. The husband didn't have much money but he wanted to control her money. And whenever we sat down to talk about their goals, we could, I could never get agreement out of both of them. And it got to quite a dysfunctional point at one, at one stage after a year or so of this where she just rang up one day and said, Hugh, invest the money. The next day, he rang me up, or sent actually, he didn't ring me up, he sent a fax to the office and fired me. And, you know, the irony of that was 10 years later when I was selling my house in Australia. The wife wanted to buy my house because she'd heard about that it was on the market because this would be good for living in in the later years. And when she went home and told her husband, he threatened divorce. <laughs> um, so what we're getting at there is that in the end, with that, with, that, with that client, I didn't understand who they were. I did not really know who they were. And this would be typical of all of us. We get referred clients and we don't necessarily always know who they are after, after quite a while. But they were the one client out of my whole client base, let's say I had 100 clients who I didn't know because all the other clients were happy. They were the one client that didn't go through the behavioural discovery process that I'm going to talk to you about today. So what creates wealth? Why do, how do people build wealth? We've heard a lot about the markets today, but what I really want to talk to you about is, or bring up the point of, is that it is how people handle the markets emotionally. It's really their emotional reflex systems. How well do people manage their emotional responses? What we call their financial emotional intelligence. That's going to be the difference between success and failure in the markets. And so as advisors, we need to take, out, take the client on a journey of behavioural discovery up front before we build the financial plan to understand who the client is, to understand the differences between a husband and wife, and if there are family members uh, of decision-making age, to understand their behaviours as well. In building a financial planning business, and if you look at the 
the four blue circles there, they're all issues, business issues that you have to deal with, whether it's client engagement, executing a plan, investment management, and financial product suitability. At some level, they're all the numbers side of the business. But your success or failure in dealing with those areas is actually related to human behaviour. And there is some great research from Mir Statman, who's a professor at Santa Clara University in San Diego, who, which states or has brought out that 93.6% of the financial planning process is behavioural management of the client. Why is that? Look at all those items in the blue circle there, in the dark blue, that represent the 93.6%. They are all related to human behaviour. The tactical management of a portfolio is 6.4% of the financial planning process. Where are we all spending our time when we're handling or managing the financial planning process? I doubt it is 93.6% on the human behavioural issues. And maybe it doesn't need to be 93.6% of the behavioural issues, but it needs to be a lot more than what we're spending. Now, what's the normal process when we meet a new client or we're dealing with existing clients? What do we do? For most people, the traditional process has been a meeting, phone calls, personal observations. We try and judge the facial features, what they say, their mannerisms. This can lead to really hit or miss. Your bias, no, no matter how good your intuition is, is going to get in the way. Who you are will naturally get in the way. It's human nature. We're all flawed as human beings. Of course, we're going to get in the way of it. Our perceptions, no matter how good we think we are with people. And so what I'm advocating to you is a more formalised behavioural discovery process where you objectively get to know who the client is. We create a report where there can be a mutual discussion with the client so that you can become their guide. Let them ask you some questions. You can ask some questions as well, and we create a more mutual framework for the discussion. And believe me, that is what's going to create the trust in the advisor-client relationship. And the client's going to walk away feeling understood. And that's the number one thing that all human beings want. And also, from a compliance point of view, it's going to be a lot better if you have got documented who the client is, and from a succession management point of view as well, if you can document your client base, it makes it easier to transfer and to bring in other staff later on. So the journey I'm taking you on today is in part to question the traditional investment risk profiling process and look at how it can be replaced with a holistic financial personality discovery process. Because the problem with traditional risk profiles is, and some of you probably use them, and some are a little bit sceptical of them. And certainly, when I was an advisor, I was actually sceptical of a lot of the risk profiles out there because they were very singular in nature. They only told you about the investment risk profile of the client, the investment risk profile. There are more behavioural issues in the investment risk profile to know. Importantly, they were situational, or they are situational. They tell you who the person is today. And these are the, what I'm talking about, these are the 5 to 25 questions type processes. Some of them are very light, some are processes out there are quite good and heavily validated. But they're not telling you all about who the client is. And so when I embarked on this journey to build a system with the help of behavioural specialists to use in my own advisory practice in Australia, and now we use it uh, further beyond that, we sort of went through the analogy of it's a bit like asking someone, can you drive a car? Everybody says, yes, I can drive it really well. Do you drive a car badly? No, no one's going to say that they do. So there's a natural tendency in life to overstate your strengths and understate your blind spots. And that is true when we are responding to most of the risk profiling instruments out there. So what's going to happen is that you are going to get a higher risk profile for the client than perhaps who the client is. And what academic research has proven is that, that you're going to get an overinflated risk profile under the traditional scoring models by one standard deviation. And this is why we have adopted a model that's called a forced choice scoring model 
that looks at natural instinctive behaviours to eliminate that risk of getting an overinflated result. What am I meaning by a forced choice scoring model? And it's highlighted here on the screen. And if I just take the, you know, the, middle, the middle example there, confidently faces danger, interactive or self-assured. You've got to choose most like and least like between these three options. For me, personally, it's easy to say because I'm an introvert, I'm not interactive. That is clearly my least like. The other two are more questionable for me in which I'm my most like. But what we're doing is putting you into a non-situational instinctive state to uncover your natural DNA behaviour that's going to be the foundation uh, of who you are. Whereas the traditional situational scoring questions are like this. What degree of risk would you say you've taken with past financial decisions? These questions all become, and they're usually rated, you're ranking one to five, are all situational perception-based questions. So you're going to get a situational perception-based result, which is not going to last for the duration of the client's lifetime. So therefore, you could be building a portfolio based on your mood at a particular time and the client's mood at a particular time. Now, I mentioned before that one of the flaws in the traditional risk profiling model is that they only focus on investment risks. What, we want to, what we're doing as advisors is we've got to focus on who the whole person is. So we've actually got to go beyond the investment risk behaviours and also look at the financial behaviour risks and the relationship behaviour risks. Which do you think of those three is going to cause a greater risk to the success of the financial planning? Which of those three? Who would say investment risks? Who would say financial behaviour risks? Looking at you know, what people spend money on, for example. Did I overcapitalise on a house? Could be a big danger. Just spending too much money without budgets. Not being focused on the plan properly. Or the relationship behaviour risks. Don't manage that properly. Poor relationship with the advisor. Clients start making bad decisions around you. Poor, poor relationships within a family unit. Or between husband and wives. We get divorce. We get payouts. We get dysfunctional decision making. It's got to be a much bigger cost than making a mistake on the investment behaviour risks. At the end of the day, they're all important and they all have to be understood. So what I'm doing is putting to you today the proposition that understanding holistically the financial personality of the client is absolutely key. Because the traditional tools are only going to tell you the investment risk propensity. Will someone take a risk? they're not necessarily actually going to tell you the tolerance, which is really around the loss aversion level of the client. That's a major issue. Can someone actually emotionally handle the consequences of their decisions? That is a different behaviour than the investment risk propensity. Then you've got the financial and relationship risks, and then you've got to deal with the financial advisor bias in there. Your personal bias can influence the clients. The clients can eat your behaviour. And as advisors, it's, we can suffer from overconfidence or what's called myopic light loss aversion as well. I know as an advisor at times, even though I'm an aggressive decision maker for myself, at times, I suffered from a myopic loss aversion when I was dealing with my clients. I was way too conservative. So when we're looking at a client's financial personality, what is it? It is a person's natural DNA behavioural style that they're born with, that is shaped into them, hardwired into them by the time they are three years old. That is a little bit like the Mississippi River running down the middle of your brain. It is fixed in there by the time you're three years old and that behaviour is not really going to change. Who you are and the broader personality will change or evolve situationally based on life experiences, values and education from time to time. But when you're under pressure, you are going to revert back to the natural hardwired behaviour. And I want to sort of describe this here in the graph where you can see that the, 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 the broader 
grey bar in the middle of the graph there is showing your natural DNA behaviour that is going to remain with you through your life. This is what we have proven in the validation processes as well, that it will be consistent and you're going to revert back to it or a client will revert back to it when they're under pressure, which is usually caused by money and relationships. It is their instinctive behaviour. But at times, people will have a level of overconfidence and therefore their situational behaviour will be higher as shown on the graph, which creates a risk behaviour gap and it can go the other way where there is a, a loss aversion. As advisors, that's what we've got to deal with because you're going to get clients who are going to come into you and say, you know what, I think I can take risks. I can take some risks to achieve those goals. But can they really? Because when they're under pressure, they're probably going to be the ones who are going to sell. And that's going to create a problem for you. And that's what I experienced as an advisor and I still see it going on today. People will tell you one thing about themselves, but when they're under pressure, other things start happening. That's when the instincts take over. That's what you're dealing with. So the starting point must be the natural DNA behaviour. How do we deal with that in building a portfolio? What I generally suggest is that you start with the natural DNA behaviour outcome as being right, then look at the client's goals, their financial capacity, their age, education and preferences. Maybe they're a younger person with quite a lot of financial capacity, a long way from retirement, they could take a little bit more risk, allow them to go up 10%. You might have the reverse side where somebody is closer to retirement, they really haven't quite got the capital, they certainly can't afford to lose it, maybe we go down 10%. How far you move away, up or below the DNA, natural DNA behaviour line is going to come down to the discussion you're going to have with the client. Because the whole idea here is to trigger a deeper discussion with the client on objective terms about the decisions that you're going to make and then document it and manage it. That's going to be the compliance process. If all of this is in your head, it's really useless. It's got to be documented somewhere. So that's really what I'm getting at. And I'm going to be showing you some case studies of how this actually works with some live clients. So what I'm talking about is giving the client really an MRI scan. Imagine you've got a sore knee or an injured knee with ligament problems. Are you going to let the doctor do surgery on you on the basis of an x-ray? Because it's not much more than guessing. Or will, will you ensure that an MRI scan has been done and that the, the doctor actually knows what's going on inside your knee and can make a proper assessment of what to do and where the damage is? Clearly, we all want an MRI scan. No one is going to have an operation on an x-ray. So what am I talking about here is uncovering all of who the client is. And I'm fortunate enough to be talking to you today because of, of one of your advisors in here, in particular Rick Helbing, who has been a passionate maven for human behaviour and deploying it in his practice. And what Rick does is that each client that comes in to see him, he gives them a natural behaviour assessment, financial DNA natural behaviour assessment to understand their core natural behaviours and their risk style. And then he gives them, which takes them about 15 minutes to do, then he gives them a learned financial behaviour risk profile as well, which is structured differently to uncover their learned behaviours so that he is getting a holistic picture of who his clients are to start off the process. Because he really wants to know who the clients are like, like I did when I was running an advisory practice. And so what, we, what I'm talking to you about is and what Rick's really become is not a financial advisor or wealth manager anymore. He's become the behavioural guide of his clients. He has moved a step across because he wants to know, engage and grow them. And he recognises that they're all different. Every person wants to be treated as a unique being. Matt, Matt talked about engagement yesterday. You know, the next pillar of engagement is the deeper emotional connection with the client. You've got to understand who they are. Just serving the client well and having them satisfied is not enough because when there's a problem, they're not going to ring you up. The emotional connection is when you truly understand them and they've got a problem and they ring you up. They don't go to someone else down the street. A key issue in behavioural finance is the reframing of your communication. Now, I'm sure this cartoon, well, I'm getting a couple of laughs, which is good. 
right? That's the idea, because we've all dealt with this. We've all suffered from it. Let's assume in the bottom left we've got a financial advisor, Chris Coddington, and you'll see his profile in a minute. He talks on his terms to the client. Then you've got the husband and wife there, Helen and Tony Jones. Do they understand? Have they properly heard what he said? Chris has communicated through his lens. He's a strategist. She's more of a lifestyle person. And her husband's an entrepreneur. They're, here, they're all hearing different messages in the room. And so to be successful, we've got to reframe our communication to be on the client's terms, not on our own. That means we've got to understand the different communication styles of our clients. You can do this with a process that takes two minutes to upfront, even before you've met the client, to understand the different communication styles of your clients and then be able to come together into that state of uh, what I've got highlighted there is relationship performance where there's really a matching. There's communication going on on people's, other people's terms or if you can't do it, assign somebody in your business that, that has got of a similar style to the client so that there can be that natural level of interaction. And that's what a lot of advisors do because in the end of the day, part of, the, part of this is once you mature your business, which all of you have, is having the ideal clients for you. More likely, they're going to have a similar communication style to you. It will be easier. So let's look at a few case studies here. We've got Chris Coddington. He's a strategist. He's a risk-taking venturer. And in the interest of self-disclosure, he is pretty similar to me. So you might have all made some assessment of me already, but this is pretty similar to me. So he's a financial advisor. His strength is he's quite venturesome. He likes to take risk, but he can take poor chances. He could make mistakes with clients by being overconfident. That would be a, an advisor client type bias that he has got. That's the risk that he brings. Now, we had Chris as the advisor. He has completed a financial DNA assessment. He has answered 46 forced choice questions to come out with a result that looks like this in one page that tells you 10 items about his financial performance success factors and his financial performance um, risk factors. The risk factors being on the left in the lighter blue colour and the performance success factors being on, on the right. And it's all built around the risks really to building a quality life. Because that's really what financial planning is about. about how can we help our clients achieve their goals? These are the risks, the 10 risks to helping clients achieve their, their goals. Now I'm going to go through this report but using some different case studies so you can get a little bit more insight about what the numbers and things mean so you can get a perspective on this. Because when I use a percentage in there, and if we look at the top one on the left, may take inappropriate chances, and Chris is 98% there, he might take inappropriate chances more than 98% of the population. It is very, very extreme. This is the factor that most risk profiles out in the market are measuring, is the first line there. So he's a high risk taker, the question is, can he live with the consequences of taking the risks? He has got a high risk tolerance or a low loss aversion. More than 99% of the population. That is very, very high. So what we, again, reiterating the point, we have split the analysis of risk for investment purposes between those two factors. And I'll show you in a case in a minute as why, why that was done. What we do with that information is we provide it to you into seven categories. So Chris is a category seven investor. He is inside the top 2% of the population. He would have a very aggressive portfolio potentially. But again, you need to discuss the facts and circumstances with him. And then the group one on the left hand side is the much more conservative person. So you can see it is population weighted. This is all measured on a, on a bell curve and I won't get into the, the science of how that comes about but other than to tell you this is where people sit relative to each other. And then you can use that to build the portfolios knowing where someone 
is in, re in relation to the rest of the population in terms of their decision-making propensities. Now, here is the advisor nightmare client. And this isn't the client that I was referring to at the start because I didn't know anything about them. This one we know something about, but it is a potential Molotov cocktail. Because the risk propensity for taking chances high at 73% is way higher than the risk tolerance for living with the losses. So this is the client that's potentially going to say yes to every deal and want to jump in. They're going to be the client that wants to get into a, um, a high-performing hedge fund. But when it loses money, they're going to be an emotional wreck. Now, this, would, this, this kind of balance of numbers would happen in 20% of client cases. So you want to be on the lookout for it. We, in fact, got one the other day where the risk tolerance, where the risk propensity for taking the chances was in the 70s and the risk tolerance was in the 30% area. It's even worse than this. But I didn't get time to put that graph into this slide to scare you a little bit more about the behaviours that you can get from um, clients. In the end, with this type of client, you're going to, you're going to invest him in the, probably in the group four in the middle. You don't want him taking more risks than what he can live with. Now let's look at Helen Jones. She's an outgoing people connector. In real life, she was a trainer. She loved being with people. Now, she's a home experience manager. So her strength is with people, loves connecting to people. She probably, if she was here, she probably would have, all of you would have met her before this morning. Okay? She, she, she is that type of person. But she can become very emotional when she makes decisions. And because of that emotion, she can sabotage herself and become an emotional wreck at some point. And she is a herd follower. This is a person that goes to a dinner party, hears a good story, and then wants to invest. Always accumulating information, always hearing the good things out there. Wants to jump in and then wonders why it doesn't work for them. They've been sold a pup. Now, one of the other issues for someone like Helen is that she is a spender, in effect. So there's a lot of financial behaviour risks. And I want to make a point here is that, and this is particularly as I'm in a mixed audience here, none of this is gender-based. So just because I'm talking about high spending, I don't want the guys just thinking, oh, it's all about the women. Because there are a number of you as the guys in this room who would be high spenders too and would actually be like Helen if you didn't manage your behaviour. And I'm sure as all as good wealth managers, you're managing your behaviour. Okay? Um, I've got a couple of laughs from the women, so I'm sure that's not the case. Um, but the point is, this is, not gen this is gender neutral. That's really what I want to make out to you. So you can see there, on the left-hand side, she has a tendency to be financially disorganised, has a high desire to spend. She could cause a lot of financial risks to building a quality life because she might spend too much money on the home, uh, not budget, spend too much money on clothes, uh, all those types of things. Look after the family too well, eat out at restaurants, not save money at any point. This is the challenge for her that needs to be overcome. In terms of being a herd follower, so that's sort of a concept that comes up in behavioural finance, she's the type of person that's going to leap into the market when everybody else is leaping into the market at the top and she's going to be the person that gets out when it's going down because she's going to be following the herd. And because she's a dinner party person listening to the deal out there, the hot news, she is likely to say that she wants to take a lot of risks. So therefore, you can see on the right-hand side where I've got the red box, she could be a group six uh, investor from just her own what she says to you or communicates to you. But in reality, she's a Group 4 investor, and you need to know that as the advisor to manage her to a Group 4 level. Now we've got an interesting case, Craig Moon, a patient stabiliser. I always bring Craig up because he's a different type of client. 
He founded an accounting software business. He's an entrepreneur. And just imagine, he's coming to see you and you know that. And he's worth a quarter of a billion dollars from a, running a successful business. The mistake that you can make with him is to think that he is that kind of hard nut entrepreneur that you talk very directly to. You might even think he's going to be a bit of a bully when he walks into your room, uh, very goal driven, going to take charge of the whole process. In actual fact, he's a teddy bear. He's looking for stability. He's all about his family. His family security is key. Something that's interesting with this type of person is they need financial guarantees. Every person who's come out extreme in this profile that we've, that we've measured over the last 12 years wants a financial advisor to guarantee their results. That is actually quite scary for the financial advisor. So you've got, you've got two issues. You've got to build a relationship with him. This is a very relational person. You've got to go slower. Maybe even think about sitting on, on a sofa, not at a boardroom table. Lighten it up. Understand his feelings. Your listening skills need to be at their best when you're dealing with him. You need to provide him with stability. But if you can do all of that, he will delegate to you. So this could be the perfect client. If you can get him over the loss aversion issue. That's your major challenge when you're dealing with this client because he is so loss averse. But he's got all of this money. The reality is he's not going to... He's not going to handle it too well, even though he's got a lot of money, if he sees it getting lost in the market and in deals and things like that. He wants to ensure that his family is protected for the future. And that's the framework in which you've got to talk to him and communicate and relate to him. That would be very different than if Chris Coddington was actually the client, who would be looking at, I've got $250 million, how do I put 249 of it back into deals? because that's what you're dealing with. Now, the last case, another very interesting one that's evolved over the years. You've got Frank Butler. He's 39 years old, and he's a retired technology entrepreneur, temporarily retired. He set up a business with five, four other people. They sold out. He banked $4 million after tax, and Innately, he is a very, from a hardwired behaviour point of view, he's a very goal-driven person. He's actually looking for the next opportunity. That's what he really wants to do. And potentially has a lot of optimism about making money in the future. But he said one thing in the first client meeting. I've got this $4 million now, and I don't want to lose that money in the investment markets, and I am not financially educated. So the warning signs have gone up. They're out there. The advisor is on notice. So the advisor in that case gave Frank financial DNA to do to understand his natural hardwired behaviour. And we could see what came out was he's a group six investor. He is a higher risk taker. And the question was asked of Frank in the conversation. So Frank, tell me about the risk you've taken. And he reeled off all sorts of risks that he had taken. He was a high risk taker and he admitted it. But he said, guess what? I don't want to take any risks with this four million now because when I was eight years old, my parents went from riches to rags. So the money history came out. There was some life baggage there that needed to be addressed. That came, that's not an easy question. That's not an easy thing to find out. It's not an easy question to ask about people's money baggage so directly early on. But he brought it out. He admitted it. So really what we're dealing with is a group three investor. Doesn't want to take any risk. But you've got someone who is goal-driven, return-orientated. So the problem is they start asking for where are the returns. Don't want to take any risk, but I want returns. That's a problem. That's a communication issue. So what we did with Frank was we discussed all of those issues because I was, I was working with the advisor at that time to help him with this. And 80% of the portfolio at the start went into lower risk portfolio around the group three and 20% went into group five because what we got him to do was to, 
to put 20% of it into more of an accumulation portfolio so he could see returns being made and buy into it. Then after a year when he was comfortable with that, another 20% went in. Then the next year, another 20% went in. And roughly today, he is now 60% invested in the Group 5 area um, and 40% and at, at the Group 3. But this is really sort of the, the advisory concept, the behavioural guiding process that's gone on to have an on above the surface, on the table, discussion with the client about the decisions that need to be made. So how do we formalise all of this in dealing with the client? How do we make it practical at the end of the day? One, the behavioural information I'm talking about can be put into your databases, whether it's a CRM or a financial planning software like Money Guy Pro or something like that. But also you can utilise it to create a behavioural investment policy statement. So this is really a, a document that you create as the advisor whereby you're bringing together now the numbers and the financial personality of the client and getting the client to sign off on the decisions that now are going to get made so that when there are changes in the market or, or in life, spur of the moment decisions just don't get made. There is a proper discussion about it. It's documented. So this is sort of really in a way where rubber hits the road. So what I've really advocated to you today is that if you can do more discovery of the financial personality of the client, the planning process is going to be a lot easier down the track. It may be an extra 20 minutes of the client's time to get started with up front, maybe an extra hour of your time. And that depends on how you handle it because you can embed it into your, into your service process already. This is not meant to be therapy. This is just meant to deepen the information that you've got. But if you do that properly, then the planning becomes easier forevermore and your staff can be involved as well. Whereas if you don't do it properly, there will always be problems with the client, like I had with that one client that I never got to go through this process. And if I had any regret as an advisor is I didn't make them do it. I don't know where we would be today, but that probably doesn't matter. But it was a, a, a wake-up call to me. So you know, I, I'm sort of bringing to you to learn, the more you can learn about the client, the more effective and efficient your practice will be, the deeper you can engage the client, and then you'll be able to customise the experience as well. Does anyone have any questions that they would like to, to ask me? Just, just for all of your sake, it didn't, it didn't come up on this slide, but we, Matt is going to be sending out to you an email blast whereby over the next month, if you want to try this out with your clients, we'll personally try it out with your family, teammates, with some clients. There'll be a link there for you to do some trials with this on, so uh, please feel free to do that. Yeah, a question. Yes, the, the actual process of how to... Uh, how to get that information out of the client. Yeah, so to answer the question, how do you get the information out of the client, they complete an online survey that's take, it with 46 questions and there's an immediate result that comes back that looks like that one-page <coughs> summary that I showed, plus some other reporting information if you want that as well. And you get the questions that you want to ask. So, uh, generally speaking, the clients enjoy doing this. I think that'll be a question that some of you would ask is, will the clients do it? It's all about the process and the service that you present. And you know, if you come across that I want to build a relationship with the client, help you achieve your goals, but I want you to go through some steps to understand yourself better and that I can understand you better, there's been no client who said no to that. Does anyone else have a question? Yeah. Uh, you introduced the challenge with the married couple, yet your case studies were all individuals. Uh, would you address uh, what happens when you've got uh, divergent uh, behaviors? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Because the reality is a lot of the time you are dealing with divergent behaviors. So if I used Helen Jones as an example, she was the outgoing people connector. Her husband 
is, is quite opposite to her. In the planning process, you've got to get each of them to go through the process individually to uncover who they are. And the reality is because women make 70% or more of financial decisions based on a whole lot of research out there, you've got to, you've got to bring her much more uh, into the process than you might otherwise um, because the planning's got to be more about her. So you've got to draw out both the husband and wife but keep it to some degree focused on, um, on the female there, particularly if there's a family unit. Now, where, where does the investment portfolio end up? It's not necessarily a dividing line between the two. It could go more conservative if she's more conservative. It could go a little more aggressive if she's more, a little bit more aggressive, but you've got to look at the earning patterns within the family as well. Um, you know, and I know, I know situations where the, the, the male, for example, might be earning a lot of money, the wife's the, the, the home experience manager, and you know, what do you do there? Do you make it all a conservative portfolio? Not necessarily, but you've got to make life safe for her. So it is going to come down to the facts and circumstances, but it's got to be, in my view, a lot more female driven, with, with, but with both drawn out and the man not left feeling disrespected in the process. Any other questions? Uh, I'm curious about us as financial advisors. Um, a lot of people come into this industry because they're uh, left brain and, and very intrigued by investments. And how do you best recommend financial advisors work on themselves to become more comfortable with more of the behavioral and personality based attributes? Well, I'm, I'm, in a way, thank you for the question, I, in a way I'm your case study on that because I, I, was, t I was a CPA, the very much the left brain person and technically I still am. And it really was for me a, a, a realisation that if I could build relationships with people, understand people, in the end I was going to get a better result. That's how I looked at it. Um, and so that then took me on a journey of a lot of self-discovery as to who I was. Now, the first person that went through all of this was me. And so even today, it's still a continuous uh, journey of self-discovery. So I think that even if you didn't deploy this in your business, if you can learn as much as you can about yourself, even if you complete the first steps of um, the assessments that you're going to be offered to do and you learn about what your talents are and get in touch with yourself, and then you follow the steps that Matt's talked about in terms of engagement, you're going to start shifting in the, in, the, in the service that you bring from a left brain orientated service to a right brain orientated service. But it's going to start with, with you transforming personally. Does that, does that help? Yep. Yes. Yep. So in the case of uh, Frank Butler, as, uh, as time went on, the allocation got shifted to a higher equity exposure. Did the uh, advisor actually go ahead and rerun uh, that behavioral study each time? Or did they just sort of let it flow to that because the client became more comfortable with the risk, risk analysis issues? It's a good question. In terms of the natural DNA behavior, that assessment is only ever done once because it's hardwired uh, results and the results remain consistent over time. And we've proven that time and time again over a long testing study. So it was only ever done once. But that doesn't mean you don't review where the client's at every one to three years, depending on their life circumstances. And, and we actually deploy uh, another assessment to capture more of the situational results to see where they're at. But generally speaking, with that client, because that process with him, just to give you more context to it, started in 2004. And so the portfolio went up. It, it, was, it was invested in a more growth portfolio, 2005, 6 and 7. But I know that even in 2011, when I last had a communication with, with the advisor and that client, he had stayed the journey at 60% invested, even through the downtime, 60% invested. Um, you now he'll always, uh, in, in, the, in the category fight, but he'll always ask the question every year. 
He asked the question, where are the returns? But the process brought him back to what his profile was and what the initial discussions had been, and he was comfortable with that. He was bought in, and he's still engaged with that advisor, you know, eight, eight or nine years later. So that's how, how it panned out. Any other questions? I just want to be clear. So you replace, you don't do a risk tolerance questionnaire any longer. You replace it with what you're yes. recommending. Yeah. Now, if you use one already and you want to keep using it, I'm never going to say no to that because I think the more information you have on the client, the better. But you could replace it with this. I think it's understanding the fact that what you're getting here is insights on a lot more items than the investment risk profile and that you're getting a stable result um, over time. But I think the more that you can know about the client up front and then in the ongoing journey, the better. 